Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q. And in this video, I'm going to give you a full review of the Soviet Tier 7 Premium Heavy, the Tupolev Tu-1. Here's the Tupolev Tu-1 on the tarmac outside my hangar. And this is the camouflage that you get in the shop bundle. Uh, however, it's not the nose art, which in this case is applied to the engines, nor the emblem. Those only convey standard bonuses. And I'll talk about that in a moment. The camouflage itself gives you 5% aircraft experience, which is worth having. I think I'd prefer 20% crew experience, but there you go. Something is better than nothing. This nose art gives me the standard 3% crew experience. I just prefer the look of it. However, this emblem here gives me 5% aircraft experience. And of course, if you've got crew accelerate crew training ticked, that's actually 5% crew experience instead. And that's 3% better than the emblem that comes with the camouflage. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at the statistics for this aircraft in comparison to other uh, uh, tier seven heavies. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use the links below the video to skip ahead to another section. Here's a spreadsheet of all the tier seven heavies in the game. There are eight of them. Let's explain how it works quickly. You'll find information for the Tupolev Tu-1 in column C and D, and each of the other heavies occupy two columns of their own off to the right, as you can see. Down the left, the characteristics for the aircraft that you can see in the hangar UI are listed. And in this table, you have the information for each aircraft. The configuration for each aircraft was stock in each case, ordnance where available was mounted, equipment was taken off, the pilot was sent back to the barracks, and the modules were all top. Where you see green here, it's best in class, light blue is second best in class, light purple third best in class, and a gold banner behind the name of the aircraft indicates that it's a premium or reward plane. If we scroll down, we'll see that the logic has been reversed uh, in terms of what is worst in class, and the darker the red, the worse it is. We'll come back to that. So having explained how the spreadsheet works, let's actually go and take a look at the aircraft themselves. Well, gun armament is first in the list and it's the business end of the aircraft after all. So let's start with that. And if we look at the overall rating, it looks like good news. It's light blue and therefore it's second best in class. However, there's quite a complicated story here, so pay attention. If we look at the cumulative uh, DPS, we'll see that this isn't second best in class. It's not even third best in class. Best in class is the KR-94 by some distance, as you can see, the Zwilling and the, the VB-10 are second best in class, again by some distance, and even the F7F uh, Tiger Cat has considerably more DPS. That may surprise a few people. In brief, the way the overall rating is calculated is unknown to us. Uh, undoubtedly, the World of Warplanes team take into um, account things like burst length, which we can't see. And unfortunately, I haven't got the information for that because the site from which I get that kind of information is currently broken. The owner is trying to fix it. It depends on accuracy, which we also can't see, although I'll talk about that in a moment. And it will depend on range. And because I can show you the range, I'm just going to point out that these aircraft are doing enormous amounts of DPS, but the range is, in the case of the KR-94-1, 1900 feet, just a little bit below that for the Zwilling, a little bit better for the VB-10, where the 420s will do uh, work at uh, 2200 feet and above, and even a little bit better for the Tiger Cat, where the 20s will do work at so just under 2,500 feet, but their machine guns that make up quite a bit of their DPS of will only do damage at about 1,700 feet. Well, we have here on the Tupelo Tu-1 a pair of 45 millimeter cannons, and they do damage at 3,443 feet. And if you look at the rate of fire, two rounds uh, per, per uh, every two, sorry, one round every two seconds, doing 120, uh, DP, uh, 120 damage each, or 240 cumulatively. That, I suggest, is why this figure is rated up here as being second best in class, when the DPS is actually quite a long way below quite um, a number of the other heavies. The only other aircraft that can snipe the way that the Tupelo Tu-1 can is the KR-93, which has a 57mm cannon, which fires a little bit faster, rounds come out every one and a half seconds, and does a little bit more damage, 250 as opposed to the cumulative 240.
However, the secondary armament on the Tu-1 is uh, quite useful. It's the familiar Soviet NS-23 cannons, which will do damage at just over 2,400 feet, and quite a lot of it as well, 250. And that's rather better than the Ki-93. So marginally, if I was in a head-on, I'd fancy my chances in the Tu-1 against the Ki-93. And that's a good thing, because as you'll see in a moment or two, the Jupiter Tu-1 is by no means as manoeuvrable as uh, the other heavies. So I've just mentioned that um, uh, the site where I get my burst information and the accuracy information from is currently down. However, whilst I didn't note, take a note of the burst damage, I can tell you I'm fairly sure that the dispersion angle on these 45mm cannons is 0.2. Very accurate guns. And the auto aim angle is likely to be pretty high as well, which means that the game will definitely assist you to hit targets at long distance. If you've watched my previous video, or you watch the replay that's contained in this video, you'll see that I don't have a lot of trouble at hitting extreme distance. And that's what you need to do with these guns if you can. Finally, on the subject of guns, uh, the Tu-1 is one of two tier seven heavies that has rear guns. It has two turrets, one on the top and one on the bottom towards the rear. That's why it says one plus one, 12.7 millimeter machine guns, doing 144 cumulative damage at a range of about 22, 2300 feet. Uh, this may deter a badly damaged bot. It won't get anything that's full health off your tail, probably, unless you can keep it out, outside of the range of their guns. That said, it's considerably better than the rear gun on the Ki-93. So let's take a look at the rest of the characteristics. And it's an easy story with regards to ordnance. The Tu-1 doesn't carry any. You may finish off a, a, a badly damaged uh, ground target in order to flip a base with the guns but strictly you're looking for air superiority against other aircraft. Survivability, the news is good. We have 700 hit points, which is 200 more than any other aircraft in this class. This makes the Tu-1 rugged. And if you combine that ruggedness with the, uh, the ability to shoot at long range, let's think about uh, something like a B-32 bomber, maybe a B-29C Super Fortress that you will see in this aircraft you can actually exploit this um, uh, ruggedness and this range to do a lot of damage to those aircraft before they can do too much damage to you. The same cannot be said, for instance, of something like um, the Ki-94, which in theory can do an awful lot of damage to those bombers, but has to do it at such a close range that it's gonna take a lot of damage unless it manages to, manages to do it directly from below, from above, or from in front. As far as airspeed is concerned, it's uh, on the low side. Um, however, do note that you have plenty of boost and that may help you escape pursuing heavies, especially if they start off with a low amount of boost in the first place. But in terms of pure speed, you're not going to outrun them. And I can tell you, you're not going to outclimb them and you're not going to outdive them either. That dive speed is the worst in class, as we'll see when we drop down quickly to have a look at uh, uh, the logic below. And the same can be said for the maneuverability. Again, it's pretty much worst in class. All of the other heavies will outmaneuver it, and you're going to have to be keep a special eye out for the two premium aircraft, the XPE 75 Eagle and the VB 10, because they are what I might call anti heavy heavies, and they will give you a lot of trouble with their speed and maneuverability. Altitude performance, again, it's on the low side. Uh, when compared to other heavy gunning aircraft, for the most part, um, with the exception of the VB-10. As far as the Hornet and the Tiger Cat are concerned, something we haven't talked about, uh, because it's not relevant to this video, is their ordnance capability, which is extremely high. And because they're being pushed into a multi-role or ground attacking role, the balancing factor there is low altitude performance. And probably you won't be fighting against these too often unless you catch them below you. If we look at quickly at the worst in class figures, we already know about ordnance. The plane's not carrying any, so that's not really relevant. You're not using it as a grand attacking for grand attacking. I don't pay any attention to the red. It just happens to be the third worst in class because those there are very few figures um, across the board for all of the heavies. Survivability is the best in class. 
you see that uh, there are problems with the airspeed and there particularly the dive speed is shown as the worst in class. You're not going to dive away from it, uh, any other, other heavy. The maneuverability overall rating is worst in class and you can see there's plenty of red here as well. Roll rate is very poor. The maximum optimum speed is not very good either. And the altitude performance is fairly indifferent too. So let's sum this aircraft up. It's a gun platform. It's a gun platform that can hit at very good long range and those guns are pretty accurate. You should do everything you can to make them accurate in terms of pilot skills and equipment, of course. And if you can do that and you can uh, keep your aircraft fairly level and fairly fast, try not to uh, engage in heavy uh, steep climbs or indeed steep dives and indeed turning combat then you should do extremely well in this aircraft. And I think my previous video and the replay that's coming up shows you that when the circumstances are right for this aircraft, it's a bit of a monster. Let's have a look at how I've set my TU-1 up. Um, now, if you skip the number section, I'll summarize briefly. This is a sniper because of the 45 millimeter cannons that can hit at 3,443 feet. It's a gun platform. This is not a maneuverable aircraft. It does not climb well. It does not dive well. So you want to keep it as straight as possible, as fast as possible, and generally as high as possible. You need to think really hard before you go down to perhaps take out ground attackers, because it's going to take you quite a while to get back up out to altitude to take out, for instance, bombers that may have come to a sector that you're in. That said, let's look at the aircraft setup and it's in specialist configuration which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available, and let's see what I've done with them. Uh, since this is a sniper aircraft, you want to do everything you can to improve the accuracy of the 45mm cannons, and to be fair, the 23mm cannons as well. Um, and as you can see, not only have I put a gun sight on, I've actually chosen to put on an experimental piece of equipment for this aircraft. As the aircraft is not maneuverable, I've concentrated on uh, speed here. I've mounted an, an uprated engine. F for the forward um, firing weapon, I've put on uh, experimental bolt car carriers, and that gives me greater burst length. And I'm also probably going to make sure that I get a good rate of fire and cooldown characteristics. So I may change the ones that I've currently got, but they're a pretty good selection, to be fair. As far as the turrets are concerned, I've put on the turret gun sight uh, to increase the range of my defensive turrets. They don't do a lot of damage, so you want to start doing it as early as possible. At least that's my theory. As this is a, a twin seat aircraft, I've got a medical uh, a first aid dressing package uh, on the aircraft so that I can heal my gunner or my pilot. I have put on pneumatic control assist. It may help with some fights with heavies. That's a questionable choice and I may revisit that. We've got 45 seconds of boost, and I've decided to put another 55, uh, 10 seconds on top of that, because if you're pursued by a, a heavy, the chances are it's the boost that will save you, because you won't probably be as fast as that heavy, and it will catch you up initially. Universal ammunition and uh, universal ammunition for the turret guns. I don't use gold, as uh, I have stated often before. Well, the TU-1 is a premium aircraft, so in theory it's a crew trainer, and I suppose you can train crew for your ground attackers, but it's the only Soviet heavy in the game, so you're not training a crew for a Soviet heavy planes. Maybe they will come one day, I don't know, in which case this aircraft will uh, gain a little bit more significance. In this case, I've decided to dedicate a pilot to this aircraft, because I think it uh, requires it. And if we look at the skill set, the two that I want, having um, gone for aerodynamics expert first in order to improve the effect of the equipment I've mounted, the things that I will be concentrating on above all will be, be the engine guru and the marksman skills, and I'll give primacy to the marksman skills. In fact, so much is that the case, I might, when I've acquired enough points, take, in fact, I could do it now. If you think about it, if I took off engine guru one and also the fire resistance, I would have enough for Marksman 3. That could very well be worth doing. If not, then I'll steadily be building up points for this one next and then this one. 
as far as the gunner is concerned, I have put in um, uh, a gunner from a Grand Attacker. It's a pretty good gunner. The one thing here that's obviously missing is uh, the uh, precision gunner. That said, I've already mentioned that the rear gun on the TU-1 isn't particularly um, potent. So this is a good enough set of skills and it's not really worth spending too much more time going down to the nth degree to decide whether this skill is better than that skill. Right, so that's how I've set the aircraft up. I think it's time to go and see how it performs in battle. The map for this battle is Alpine Gambit. It's the collision variant. It's a five sector map with the sectors in a very squashed five spots of the die configuration. There's a central military base, which is strategically and tactically the most important sector by far on this map. Strategically because it launches rocket strikes at other sectors and tactically because it's central, it provides easy access to those sectors. It's flanked by a pair of air bases not so useful on, on this particular map because they're not in the centre, but you can select them as a spawn point. You can select a different aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed, or you can get full repairs. And also flanked by a pair of garrisons, uh, which just convey the standard three resources every five seconds. If we look at the order of battle, we have a P P-51D, but it's flown by 123-123 Russ. Watch out for me mentioning him in the battle results section after this uh, battle. The IL-10, Grand Attacker, and myself in my specialised TU-1. Opposing us, we have a P-51D, a Zwilling, a BF-109Z, or Z if you prefer, I do. Uh, that could be a troublesome aircraft for me. And then a Tier 6 bomber, the B-17G. So in theory, I would say the order of battle favours us, but I've already mentioned 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, Russ. Let's see what happens. And as we go into battle, I've emphasised the importance of the central military base, so it's no surprise, I'm sure, that that's where I'm headed. Now, we already know that this aircraft doesn't have a particularly good altitude performance, so I move into the yellow altitudes and then level off and head towards that military base. I'll be looking to take out the two defenders, which will be heavy aircraft, of course, and any intruding heavies or bombers. Begin to weave to avoid the flak, as usual. Spot the heavies. Do a little bit of damage. And just avoid the ram, which is unusual for the air defense heavies, especially against this. I'm swinging around to see if I can finish them off. There's the first one. Decide that I will take on the heavy in case it threatens me from behind. Have a quick shot at the bomber on the way through. Decide I'm in no danger from the heavy currently and decide to finish off the bomber. Swing round for the heavy. My team assists me in capturing the military base, so we've made a good start. It turns out to be a Mosquito 26, the tier 6 uh, heavy, and I demolish it with the guns. And here's the B-17G, and he's just about perfectly lined up for me. I'm coming in from in front of him. I've got a very long range gun. He does the right thing and tries to swing around so he can get his guns to bear on me, but by that time he's already lost half of his health. Or nearly half of his health. And he's a little bit lucky. Some of my shots actually did critical damage instead of taking his hit point pull, so I probably took about two or three seconds more to lock, knock him down than I might have. There's another bomber, and of course, one of the class-specific missions for heavies is to destroy enemy bombers or ground attackers, so you won't be surprised that I keep a very careful eye out for them and take them whenever I can. And as you can see, I've got three already. The 
the mosquito returns. That's my target of opportunity. And as you can see, the 45 millimeters when they both land are very effective. Grand attacker comes in conveniently in front of me. Another one that's on low health arrives. And I take out both of them. And at this point I'm beginning to wonder whether I should go elsewhere because with three sectors to one down. The points are fairly level. This is the critical area and it will be attacked so I decide to stay. And it's a good decision because we've taken another sector. And I'm pretty confident that provided we have the military base, we'll flip uh, sectors more quickly than the enemy can hold them. another bomber falls and we're already up to a grade 4 aircraft simply by concentrating our, on our specific class specific missions. I decide to take the tornado because that will give me more trouble than the swilling in terms of maneuverability but the swilling doesn't pay me any attention and I shoot him out of the sky as well. That leaves me free to chase the bomber, the B-17 again. And as you can see, pretty much in four shots, apart from a few hit points, I've destroyed him. Somebody else gets the kill, but I did the majority of the work. That's actually taken me across into another sector, so I decide to see if I can help capture it. And indeed, I can help capturing it, and a Maguire medal goes through. It's clear that the military base is under serious threat. I doubt I'll be able to hold it, but I'll see what I can do. And if I can't hold it, I will certainly want to try and take it back. Conveniently, the enemy mosquito dies. Not to me, but that gives me a little bit more time. I decide that I'm better off taking the bomber than the IL-1. I'm hoping I can kill it before it gets out of the sector. It aids me by turning back in. And down it goes. Now, juicy targets here, the IL-1. Of course, that's not a ground attacker. That's actually a multi-roll. It's a bit of a lumbering beast. And I was able to attack it and get it in line on a ground attacker. Took a bit of a chance there. That was a potential bomb trap, but I got away with that. Calculated risk, as we now have three other sectors in, as well as this one. And although it's been on the edge of being taken, we've been able to uh, keep it by dint of shooting down aircraft at uh, the last moment. Again, I keep an eye on the Mosquito to make sure I'm not jumped by him. The Winged Legend goes through. Swing around to see whether I can take either the ground attack or the mosquito, or indeed both. I finish off the mosquito with a glorious clutch shot, and then proceed to try and steal the kill on the IL-2, which I do. And now my team has established superiority. I've done my job, as you can see. Class specific mission, eight attack aircraft done, 375 capture points, 15 aerial targets destroyed. I've been extremely effective and done exactly what I needed, and I've done it well. A little bit of a lull in the game, as the enemy hasn't regrouped sufficiently to get into this sector. Our inevitable victory is delayed as they capture an airfield. And that allows me to shoot at the Mosquito again. And since it's a bot, I decide to manoeuvre to try and shoot it. And it donates the rest of its hit points to me. And that's the end of the game. Very satisfactory battle. Tactically, I did exactly the right thing, helped my team pulverise the enemy with an aircraft that's excellent at doing exactly that. 
It's time to take a look at the outcome of this battle, and as you can see from the centre, it was a 5 chevron battle or a grade 1 heavy fighter if you prefer. 205,992 credits or silver, of which about 69,000 came from the premium account bonus. If we take a look in the message box, we can see that there were no expenses, the aircraft wasn't shot down, and I used prepaid consumables. 3,567 aircraft experience with bonuses, as you can see. 178 free experience and a token, which was for a first medal of the day, Hero of the Sky. Turning to the personal score tab, we can see that the class specific missions were complete, therefore the five chevrons, 17,325 personal points with two sectors captured, 16 aerial targets destroyed, one short of the Marseille there, 9,549 damaged aerial targets, and with those 45mm cannons you won't be surprised to see 29 critical hits. Capture points of 460, and they were divided 320 for defending sectors, mostly the central military base, and attacking 140 points. If we look at the team score tab, that was comfortably enough both by personal points and chevrons to take first place. Decent effort from the IL-10 player there. Our good friend 123123 Russ, who ought to be banned, did his normal of not participating in the, ba uh, in the battle. I have no idea what he's up to, but he just shouldn't be allowed to do it. On the opposing side, uh, decent contributions from the BF109Z and the P51D, but not over the central military base, if I remember correctly, and that was probably a mistake. And the B17G was in a very bad matchup and could hardly do anything else but feed me his hit points. So, now you've seen what the Tupolev TU1 can do in battle, it's time to take a look at uh, what's on offer in the shop. And there are two ba ba bundles. The standard one, I'll call it, and one designated ready for battle. Let's have a look at the standard one first. And what you get for £23, which is about €27 Euros or $33 US, is the aircraft. 100% trained crew. We'll come on to the personal battery mission on the crew in a moment and a hangar slot. Let's just turn straight to that personal battle mission. As far as I interpret this, Probably for doing something fairly simple, possibly even just playing a single battle, you will get 100% experienced crew, both pilot and gunner, with each with seven free skill points. Now, normally that wouldn't be particularly attractive on a premium aircraft, but as I've mentioned elsewhere in the video, I rather feel this air particular premium needs its own dedicated pilot, certainly, perhaps not gunner. Uh, so obtaining crew with seven free skill points will put you well on the way to having a good crew in this aircraft. There are no other Soviet heavies in the game currently, so the value of this aircraft as a crew trainer is limited by that. Let's see what you get in the Ready for Battle bundle. And this one will set you back about £28, which I think is about €33, Euros, uh, or about $40 US. You get the aircraft, you get the 100% trained crew, you get the personal battle mission as well, and you get this decoration set. And is this decoration set worth having? Well, this camouflage gives you 5% aircraft experience. I always prefer 20% crew experience personally. The emblem and nose art give you the standard values, 3% crew experience and 2% crew experience. So there's nothing particularly great there. There's a hangar slot and there's 3000 gold. And of course, to bump up the price, we have some loot boxes, five of them. Well, if you haven't got uh, much of the content of the game, you could get something good out of those, but this is something I don't particularly like to see on war game bundles, and I wish they wouldn't do it. So you have a choice of two. Is the aircraft worth either of these two bundles? Mm. That's difficult to say. For either of these bundles, if you shopped around carefully, say on Steam and got a discounted uh, a discount deal, you could get yourself a full game on which you may spend many pleasurable hours. Would you play this aircraft for as long? Hard to say. That said, if you decide that this uh, aircraft is worth your money, I would certainly say that you're not really missing much if you don't uh, take the ready for battle um, bundle. And I'd be personally inclined to take the cheaper of the two. Again, only you can decide that. What is for sure is if you buy this aircraft and you know what you're doing in it, I think you'll have a lot of fun. And that concludes my look at the Tupolev Tu-1, which in the right circumstances can devastate the enemy combat group 
and dominate battles. If you know how to fly heavies, and you know how to snipe, and you don't mind the price that the World of Warplanes team wants to charge you for this aircraft, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Well, I hope you found that useful, and that if you did, you'll come back and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Q signing out.